Hey listeners, this is Ben, the Amateur Exegete, and you're listening to episode 33 of Bible Study for Amateurs. Today's episode is Pro-Life Proof Texting. Few topics in the United States are as divisive as abortion. The right considers it murder. The left considers it health care. This podcast is not the place to debate abortion itself. Instead, I want to look at a text from the Hebrew Bible that is often employed in the abortion debate. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. If you've spent any time in the southern United States, you've likely seen a billboard that reads something like, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's from Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. On the face of it, it sounds very pro-life. One pro-life website refers to the passage as a key reference in scripture about life in the womb. But is it? Does this verse in Jeremiah support the pro-life movement in the way that they think it does? To answer that question, we need to consider Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 in context. As both of my listeners probably know, Jeremiah was a prophet whose name is attached to a lengthy work in the Hebrew Bible. Though our sources about the man are few, What we can gather is that his prophetic ministry began during the reign of Josiah in the late 7th century BCE and ended not long after Babylon destroyed Jerusalem and its temple to Yahweh and hauled off many of its inhabitants to Babylon itself. In fact, the final chapter of the book of Jeremiah, a section taken in large part from the ending of 2 Kings, details the demise of the kingdom of Judah at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. But we aren't interested in the ending of Jeremiah, but its beginning. Following a superscription in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 1, Jeremiah reports his call and commission from Yahweh. In her commentary on Jeremiah for the Fortress Commentary on the Bible, Kelly Murphy notes that call narratives, like we find here in Jeremiah, typically follow a prescribed order. First, there is an address by the deity to the appointed person. This can be found in verses 4 and 5. Here they are as they appear in the New Revised Standard Version. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Second, the appointed person explains how they just aren't up to the task. For Jeremiah, this comes in the form of his claim in verse 6 that he doesn't know how to speak because he's but a boy. Third, comes reassurance. The deity didn't pick the wrong person and any shortcomings will be shored up by the presence of the God. This is what happens in verses 7-8. through But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Finally, Proof is offered by the deity that he will come through. In verse 9, Jeremiah says that Yahweh put out his hand and touched his mouth, an act symbolic of his commission as one who has the deity's words within him. Per verse 10, Yahweh has put Jeremiah in a place of unique authority as one who can pluck up and pull down, destroy and overthrow and build and plant nations and kingdoms. In other words, the prophet has the full backing 
of Israel's God. This all may seem trivial, but as Murphy observes, Jeremiah's calling is similar to that of another famous figure of Israel's history, Moses. Moses, too, claims problems with his ability to speak, per Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. And Yahweh, in verses 11 through 12, also assures Moses, as he does Jeremiah, that he will give him the ability to speak his message. And while there are certainly differences between Jeremiah and Moses, Murphy writes that, The final editors of the book portray Jeremiah as the prophet like Moses, foreshadowed in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 22. This is important because it reveals that there is more going on here than meets the eye. Jeremiah, or if you prefer, the book's editors, is casting himself in a particular light to lend credence to his words. He is, in other words, setting himself as the authority. Verse 5, then, is performing a particular rhetorical purpose in this section of the book. The point of the prenatal call, writes Robert Wilson in the HarperCollins Study Bible, may be that the prophet's call is both early and irresistible. And if that's the case, what choice do Jeremiah's listeners have but to heed him? The billboards with this verse that you may see are therefore proof-texting from Jeremiah. By cropping out the end of the verse, wherein Yahweh tells Jeremiah that he was appointed to be a prophet, pro-life proponents who use this verse are ignoring that this language is specific to Jeremiah and is not a universal truth. That is, the point of Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 in its context is to legitimize the prophet's call and authority, not to make some point about whether personhood begins at conception or any issue related to the abortion debate. More instructive is something Jeremiah says later, in chapter 20, verses 14 through 18. There, Jeremiah curses the man who didn't kill him in the womb. This sounds like what happens during an abortion. Jeremiah even describes the aftermath of such an event. So my mother would have been my grave. And interestingly, as Richard Elliot Friedman and Shauna Delansky point out in their book, The Bible Now, in this passage, Jeremiah doesn't use the word for murder that appears in places like the Ten Commandments, but the verb for killing, which in the words of Friedman and Delansky, never means murder in the Bible. If Jeremiah is describing what is tantamount to an abortion, then he doesn't consider it murder. And thus, per Friedman and Delansky, it means that abortion does not constitute murder by the biblical definition. That doesn't, of course, mean one must agree with abortion, but simply that the Bible in general, and as we've seen in this discussion of Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 in particular, isn't explicitly against it. That's all the time we've got this week. See you next time. And remember, in the words of Richard Elliot Friedman, one does not need to deny what is troubling about the Bible in order to pay respect to what is heartening. Thanks for listening.